Dear students and colleagues from the world, welcome to Tsinghua Global Summer School 2021. Today's masterclass is on effective learners, insights on college student engagement research by Professor Shi Jinghuan of Institute of Education and Deputy Chair of the University Degree Committee, Tsinghua University. Speaking of effective learners, Professor Shi is one of the most effective learners I've ever had the privilege to know. She's also one of the best scholars and teachers I've ever had the honor to know and work with for over 15 years. To me, Professor Shi exemplifies an ideal lifelong learner. She's fast, agile in learning, and she's vigorous and rigorous in using her learning to make new discoveries in research and also to create effective teaching and practices to improve other people's learning. As a very successful learner, Professor Shi studied all the way at Beijing Normal University, one of China's best universities. She was best trained as an educational historian. She is also the first women PhD in educational history after China resumed postgraduate education in 1978. When I think of her successful career, I would like to say that she has made a huge impact in multiple fields. In academia, in her 15, first 15 years of career, she made her name as an eminent scholar in international and cross-cultural studies in higher education, especially China's early modern history in higher education development. Then over the past 15 years, she has transformed herself from a scholar of words to a scholar of both words and figures, so to speak. She has initiated and conducted one of China's most important longitudinal studies in higher education, the China College Student Survey. Since 2007, her team has surveyed over 1 million students in 180 higher education institutions in most of China's provinces. Her research provided valuable evidence-based research to understand student learning and to support educational and pedagogical reform and innovation at both institutional and national levels. Moreover, in her latest research, her team has designed a new comprehensive evaluation system to support China's world-class university and discipline department development. I'd also like to mention her leadership. As a deputy dean for 15 years, she has led the Tsinghua University Institute of Education to grow big and strong and to become one of the best institutions in educational studies in China today. So please, let's welcome distinguished Professor Shi Jinghuan of the Institute of Education, Tsinghua University. Thanks very much, Professor Zhong, listening to her introduction. I didn't realize that's, that's me. You know, when you think about your whole career, sometimes you forget what you have been, you know, uh, as a teacher in the classroom, uh, as an administrator in all kinds of projects and activities. I think it's hard to think yourself without learner. You know, this role will go with you forever. And right now is um, 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, I'm sure that uh, these over 1,000 students from how many countries? Over 100 countries or something? You know, it's hard to to think about the, you know, you are facing here with no real students in the classroom, but over a thousand we meet in the cloud. That's a word I just think about. When I look at the, uh, the photos uh, two or three months ago, 
when we celebrate the 110 years anniversaries of the university, we organize the Global uh, President Forum. And that's another big forum which presidents come from different universities all over the world. And we di discuss the issue, exchange idea without any you know, difficulties but all through online. And at that time, I think personally traveling over different countries, for me, is about over 50. Or, you know, before, it's quite easy for you just make um, international travel. But within this most, almost two years, I have never traveled. But I meet so many international friends in the cloud, online. And we discuss the issues we're interested in without any difficulties. So technology really make a big difference now. And also it raises the issues as a learner, how you really put yourself in a changing society. Okay, so how to, oh, okay. I can control here, right? Okay. So starting questions. Look at this picture, how the whole world, the global, everybody have that uh, masks. It seems uh, we are in a post pandemic uh, period, but some of the countries are still uh, having uh, the problems. Even China now, you know, we have to deal with cases happened in different places. So when you see the topic towards a post-pandemic world, what comes to your mind? Has the COVID-19 crisis changed our lives and institutions? Are we coming back or going forward after the crisis? So we need to think from our own perspective. Post-pandemic world is not a period with a clear timeline, but a kind of changed status or physical, even psychological state situations which we may feel so it's not a clear, you know, we, from tomorrow, we, we say that's the end of this uh, pandemic. Uh, is, uh, but now, maybe we'll live with them for much longer period. What, uh, just a year ago, you know, when these uh, things, when this pandemic happens, and we have to take the action in Tsinghua, and when you see these pictures, that's vividly came to my mind what we have done. Yes, please. That's January 13th, uh, 2020, the university announced Post upon returning to the campus, will commencing courses as schedule. Now, uh, students will start their schedule, their uh, classes, but not returning to the campus. In the spring semester, a total of 4,471 online courses were delivered with an accumulated participation of more than 2.8 six million students and teachers in the university. So it's a big number. And this number really brings a lot of challenges. Uh, in the autumn semester, it seems the pandemic getting better. But although most of the Chinese students came back, well, international students were still out of the campus. So Tsinghua started the integrative model of teaching learning on and offline. One teacher have to 
manage the classroom study students will caring about the students which learning online thousand miles away and time difference situations learning facilities are different so it's a, such a challenge for teachers for doing so university organized the training program for faculty members in online teaching skills you know one year earlier i couldn't think i will teach this way without seeing my students and the training includes time arrangement class interaction and the use of online platform tools the training involved more than 2600 teachers almost cover everyone who teach and including 2700 teaching assistants and volunteers to help the classroom teaching so all this work has been done without a dozen of days you know so it's really a big response and very quick response yeah. and when you see this the cctv made a uh, tinghua in cloud and shows how you know we teach and learn use this online education and then you may see all kinds of very interesting way of teaching and learning just think about physical training physical training you need really use your body uh, to move to practice to try to hands on and that's our professor zhao is training you know how to play basketball and students are learning online and in their home uh, in can be anywhere so we are quite creative both teachers and students uh they manage to handle this so learning and teaching in cloud or online as a challenge in tinghua we really face it and solve it and try to accumulate experience and make it into a, a kind of resources not a crisis you know crisis we cannot control but we can change it into a resource into an opportunities for making ourselves better so extended questions start from this we can ask ourselves what should we do as a teacher or as a learner in a post pandemic world you know now most of the students are coming back but still a number of them study online and is online teaching and learning a short term replacement for classes or a long term expansion of classroom instruction if in a, you know the second way a long term expansion of classroom instruction we need to make it really embedded into our everyday teaching and learning shall we work more actively towards a hybrid education which integrates residential and online teaching and learning and when we really want to do it why and how what colleges education really means you know technically it change but i don't think that really change the goals uh education as the uh, most important things in the human society it carries its goals forever so for a students for a teacher for a system no matter what challenges you are facing you have to believe education can make a difference so what education really 
bring the changes? What changes can education bring? And if you see these pictures, maybe some of the international students are not familiar, but those faces, two faces, one was uh, when this figure, you know, her name is Su Mingjuan. When she was in elementary school, because of the poverty, she nearly dropped out and dropped out school. And at that time, in, I think in mid, in early and mid 90s, last century, these photos really encourage the whole society to make donations for helping the students helping the boys and ch and girls from the you know uh the possibilities of drop out just the because of uh the economic situation so we call the hope projects the largest you know the project which supporting uh the poverty families and regions and make sure that these children can be returning in school. So after all these years, these two you know, figures, uh, Su Mingjuan and Zhang Tianyi, the boy, they're already graduated from the colleges. And the girl becomes <coughs> working, uh, they, they, she becomes uh, white color, you know, work in the bank, has her own family, all child, and now even work as the Anhui, you know, province, uh, the deputy uh, secretary in Youth League. It's a quite high man administrative position. And the little boy graduates from an engineering colleges and becomes an engineer. So when you see these changes, when you support Su Mingjuan, uh, go back to school. Nobody knows. Later, she will become a high uh, officials or you know uh, 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 bank uh, professionals. And so, w when you think about the changes, not that picture changes her, but education. So, education is preparing for the future life. But education is also a life itself. So when you see these grow up children, look at their eyes. They're confident, they're calm, they're ready for meeting the uncertainties. So that's the education means. Education is what remains when we have forgotten all that we have been taught in schools. Knowledge, skills can be, can be forgot, but, you know, the overall capacities, the competence, the confidence, all these elements will remain and will help you when you need it. So that's what education brings us. That's why the whole world, no matter it's the developing countries, Developed countries, they all valued education, not only basic education, even higher education. So now higher education, you can see the world gross enrollment rate of higher education increased rapidly. In China, that increased even faster you know, the, as the one of the largest the country with uh, uh, the biggest population, the higher education system in China is also uh, huge. The gross enrollment rate of higher education in China reached 12.5% uh, in 2000 and 40 in 2015, and now it's more than 50. What does that really mean? More than 50% of cohort young people 
can get into the university. So that's a big change. It's a big change. 40 million students, young students are in the campus now. So it's not just China. We see these big changes. It's globally. So if you compare with different countries, you see Sweden, that kind of massification of higher education started in 60s, tripled the total number, tripled within 10 years on the basis of 10,000 French. The France is bigger. Also start from 60, tripled the college student num students number within 15 years on the basis of a hundred thousand. What about China? China tripled within eight years on the basis of one million. So these big changes, you have to consider the re resource limitation. Uh, so China's mo the mode of popularizing higher education with the special characters, the large scale, high speed, low expenses. So that's the way the Chinese higher education massification have gone through. And also the characters of China's higher education model, if you say that's a model, is great diversity as any uh, other countries students needs, student interests, you know, with this massification uh, movement, the great diversities. The big regional development, development gaps. Uh, if you see Beijing, Shanghai, and other big cities, you see just like Western developed countries. But if you go to the West, to the rural area, and you see another pictures, uh, which may be very low, you know, developed, developing countries and still need a lot of uh, help from outside. And also China's higher education expansion have to face the mixed problems of quantitative expansion, quality increasing, and equity and efficiency, all these issues comes together. And hybrid education, as I mentioned, this online education is modern technology. It's also a new things. It's a challenge too. So if you think about, if you put these pictures together, uh, you can understand what the Chinese higher education system means. Crisis brings both the problems and opportunities. China's case really shows that. We need to explore the new opportunities hidden in the COVID-19 crisis and embrace the emerging landscape of online education. If you want to know these things better, you have to study it. You have to do the research. Uh, that's our attitu attitude. And we need to turn the compel reform as Tsinghua did. You know, all the students cannot return. So we have to post upon the returning, but start the classroom teaching. Uh, those kind of compelled reform, you have to respond quickly. But you also have the possi possibilities to change into a well-planned and better prepared comprehensive reform. That covered curriculum, classroom, teaching and learning methods, and assessment system, etc. So let's see the changes from student survey as 
Professor Zhong mentioned, things we have done that over 10 years. So we do need to compare uh, the data and to see what we, we may see from those data. Behind the data, actually, that's students' learning behavior. And also, things is a student self-reported survey. So the data shows the student's eyes and the student's experience. So the issues which I'm going to talk today, how to be an effective learner, not just from my own experience or one or two person's successful story, is from our survey, from the data we collected all over the country, the college students' learning experience. And China College Student Survey, we call it CCSS, is a project which I work as a team leader and university uh, really supported to continue doing the survey over almost uh, 12 years. And first, we uh, worked with uh, NASI, which is in the US, uh, National Survey of Student Engagement. And then, you know, we developed our own questionnaire. So now we have uh, four kinds of uh, tools, all uh, facing to different, uh, targeting the different students or uh, type of university. For example, the green uh, uh, sheet, uh, the questionnaire, uh, fit for the regular university students. And the yellow one, more focusing for the vocational and application-oriented institutions. And we specially design the uh, purple uh, questionnaire for Tsinghua University, uh, covered every student uh, through all these four years study. So it's the largest uh, national student survey in China since the 2009. Let's see what uh, we have seen from this survey. And educational information, informationization, uh, or as a policy, is a national uh, policy uh, in China. So the policy really make it very clear that by the year of 2022, we will build a platform for internet plus education, internet plus education. Strive to build a new mode of talent training in the era of uh, internet plus. Uh, so when in China's case, if you talk about talent training, not just a few very uh, uh, gifted or top students, it's covered all the students, but mainly uh, we try to make these uh, students uh, more uh, creative and not just the regular uh, learning. Uh, so uh, the, these uh, two you know, lines uh, to show the students' skills uh, in technology. Yeah. Based on the CCS data from 2011 to you know, uh, 2019, universities continued encouraging students using information technology, and the students' ICT skills have also improved too. So you see, the policy really shows the evidence in the students' learning behavior, universities' uh, uh, behavior. And this data shows the full online learning methods. Uh, so from 2016 to 2019, the proportion of undergraduate students' online learning behaviors. Uh, you can see from very often, often the, uh, those four types, you know. 
online assistant general courses learning increased from 46 to 60. Studying a course entirely through online has increased from 33 to 46. Online discussions increased from 30 to 40. Uh, so all these oh, online, um, couldn't see. But anyhow, you, you can see all these uh, figures increased. So that means even online learning have different ways, different uh, uh, channel. All these channel has been widely used in the campus. But we also see online learning behavior of undergraduate students in China has been increasing. But the frequency of online discussion is not, in, is not really changed or is insufficient. So that gives uh, us a lesson that not only teach, you know, silenced, let the students listening to the online courses, how to encourage them to do this online discussion, multi ways of discussing the issue. Online make that easier, but currently students seems not really use it uh, successfully. And the relationship between online learning and students' learning motivation, that's another issue which we are quite concerned. Some po people believe online learning will decrease the students' motivation. It's boring. Now learning itself quite lonely. But some research support that online learning, this kind of self-selective, self-regulated learning, improve the student's motivation. So these figures shows that different uh, uh, the online learning methods, the correlations with students' uh, learning motivations. <laughs> so you see, the, when you compare uh, the students who choose very often, uh, compare with the students who choose never, uh, those two groups, Using this learning, uh, uh, online learning, uh, the learning motivations of undergraduate students who use this online learning more actively, uh, their uh, learning motivations increased, uh, or stronger than the students who never uh, use that. And the Learning motivations for those who study a course completely through online platform decreased by the and the professional, you know, so that that also means the professional competence and the way of learning uh, methods are uh, you, you connected or with the students' uh, uh, learning uh, motivations. And then let's change to the relationship between students' online learning behavior and learning outcomes. You know, we now, we are, convinced, we are convinced that we have to use this technology, online technology. But what's the learning outcome? You know, outcome-based evaluation, we need to make sure that online learning and also very uh, positive in the learning outcome. So in all kinds of online learning activities, compared to the never group, the very often, often and sometimes groups have different scores on the level of holistic development and ICT skills. So those really, uh, you control the other uh, influential factors and see how it uh, connected.
Yes. But we find another very important uh, factors that personal interactions are very crucial in online learning. And students who take the whole courses completely online seems benefit less or even negative in motivations and holistic development. So for answering the questions, why we need to be deeper, uh, why the students um, learned less, uh, you, you, you may find that that's the personal interactions matters. If we connect it with another finding that students who use online discussions benefit more. So discussions make a difference. That's communication. We may have some conclusions that students' learning is a socialization, is a social active. And you say, that's my own business. Yes, it, it is your business. But if you learn in a group, if you learn in the discussions with others, you will feel happier, and you will feel more motivated. So learning is a social activity. It's not just um, you know, knowledge. Uh, uh, it's not personal minds activities. The active interactions of students with their teachers and peers are very crucial in the pro process. So that's why when we do the teacher training, the teaching assistance training, one of the important factors is to encourage them to make this discussion happen, uh, how to initiate and encourage the group discussions, the students, uh, the whole classroom discussions, and involve uh, students uh, who are not active or involve I, this kind of uh, silent students is a big challenge for teachers. Uh, this another uh, uh, survey which uh, we've just uh, designed specially for Tsinghua students. Uh, uh, our presidents really emphasizing, you know, the assessment, the research-based policy. You know, since we have this whole semester online learning, so we want to know what the students' learning behavior. So personal interactions in online education based on Tsinghua student survey shows that students thought that bullet subtitles, course playback could help them to maintain concentrations and improve their interactive engagement. So this means the skill, the technology, uh, some changes uh, design uh, really make a difference. From students' perspective, the interactions among students significantly decreased compared to uh, the online and offline. So in classroom, uh, learning together, some students may silence, but teachers can really uh, get them back. And in, but online learning, students are quite de self-dependent. So in this way, we really should encourage uh, the interactions between students and teachers. And the, these, uh, you, know, you know, we, we surveyed uh, both students and teachers since we want to compare uh, their different perspective. And for teachers, uh, they are really concerned about, you know, unstable network and technology equipments and low efficiency of teaching inter uh, interaction. You know, second uh, 
uh, select um, idea is uh, the low efficiency of teaching intera interaction. So from faculty's perspective, the most challenging issues in online teaching is ensure the quality of teaching interaction. So that's from teachers. And from students, also they mentioned that, the interactive uh, way of learning. Another issue which the survey has shown is that disadvantaged students in online education. Although we believe, uh, uh, especially in Tsinghua's case, the university spend a lot of resources to help the students who live um, in a very remote uh, or uh, in the poverty uh, regions, uh, lack of technical uh, uh, support, and university help them uh, using different way of help. But still, we find that the proportion of first generation college students means you know their parents has been has not been to university. They are the first generation college students in the family. Those students got lowest scores uh, in ICT assisted courses uh, learning. Why? So maybe that that concerns with the economic situation, but mainly I think is social capital, cultural capital, and the concerns and the ideas, uh, the understandings of this uh, uh, this learning. Uh, so we, if you see the disadvantaged students, not necessarily just the means economically disadvantaged, but also uh, some social factors also influenced. Based on the CCSS data, more than 70% of college students were the first generation college students, more than 70 in China. So if the first generation college students have the lower scores, that means we really have two concerns. The proportion of these uh, first generation students in top universities compared with uh, the community college was less. So that also means the disadvantaged students, uh, uh, although it can be uh, existed in every type of universities, but most of them or more of them in the community college, uh, locally uh, run uh, the universities. Uh, those universities need more help to really uh, uh, help their students uh, economically, socially, and uh, culturally. Okay, since we mentioned about the first generation college students, uh, I will use it more data, which not necessarily just focusing on um, ICT. Because in China, as I mentioned, 70% of current students are from the first generation college students. That's the benefit from the expansion of higher education. Means more students are getting into the universities, more opportunities for them. So their learning features of first generation college students, uh, we use our data uh, to draw a pictures. Mainly, they are good students based on our traditional uh, understandings. For example, they are in the classroom on time, uh, they, hands, uh, they hands in their homework on time, and even their learning scores, not, not a big difference compared with the non-first generation uh, students. So, a lot of teachers, they don't think that's an issue. 
you know, they are studying hard and their learning outcome is good. And why you especially concerns them? Because from their behavior, we find those students, they have less communications, less presentations or making questions in the classroom. And they spend more time on playing games or online videos themselves, but not with others or outdoor activities. They constrain themselves in a small social circles. And when they need support, difficult for them, uh, less support from, you know, most helpful people. So that shows that socially uh, lack of, uh, you know, capital or, uh, so these kind of less extracurriculum activities easily to be ignored. Teachers, they want concerns about that. They said, you know, I only observe them in the classroom. No difference, that's all. But outside extracurriculum is a big education channel based on our studies. A lot of studies has shown you know, education doesn't just happen in classroom. Outside classroom, sometimes even more important because that's a situation that's uh, involved personally, the whole person's emotional knowledge and, you know, social uh, uh, activities. So the extracurriculum activities really uh, have a big play a big role in education. If those first generations, they are lack of participations in extracurriculum activities, we make it even deeper study. Let's see what is the most focused issues we try to show. Even in the classroom studies, you can see, uh, although the score, learning the uh, examination scores is no difference, but concerning the learning activities, there is, there exists a difference. For example, the low scores in active and in reflective learning. And active participate classroom discussions and raise questions and make presentations. You know, independent learning, you have to really let others to know your ideas and to really, uh, through discussions, to make uh, the learning uh, really uh, meaningful. But in this perspective, there uh, shows the difference. And in the classroom, the low scores in academic interactions with faculties and peer students. We already mentioned that. You know, they learn themselves, not very easily with others. Uh, so this, uh, what we call the academic interactions, -rea uh, that include discussions with faculty and peer students, the course assignment, the quiz, and you know, the difficulties in learning. So these activities, that's the learning behavior. And the extracurriculum uh, behavior and in-classroom learning behavior all needs to really uh, concerns. So compare with the non first the generation college students, the less extracurriculum activities uh, in China's uh, higher education system, we uh, group them into three uh, different kind of extracurriculum activities based on educators, 
uh, we really believe uh, these extra curriculum activities are important. So we call them the high impact practices, uh, the high impact practices. The three types, one is the social practices. And in China, that's very important. And it's uh, really, we have a system uh, requires students, all the students to participate. The second is job practice. Uh, that's usually in the senior level. And a lot of universities organize that, uh, you know, from the uh, institutional level. So social practices. The second is extended learning activities. Extended learning means, you know, not just the uh, uh, classroom learning required. For example, language learning, study abroad, a second uh, degree or a minor. So that's all selected by the students. All opportunities are there. Whether you participants, you need to either pass the selection, or you have enough uh, financial or uh, you know uh, scores to support. So that's have some requirements, uh, prerequisite. And the third ac activities is research related activities. Uh, research related activities. Uh, you really, you for example, publications participant competence and participants uh, faculties uh, research project so th these three types of extracurriculum activities if you make it into the deeper analysis you may see the social practices almost no difference you know the the most that uh, part and the second, extended learning activities. Now, the blue bar is uh, the first generation. The green bars is uh, the non-first uh, generation. And also, the research-related activities, all big difference. Uh, so now, we even understand better that social studies okay because it's guaranteed by the system the university organized that without any prerequisite but the extended learning activities the research related activities first generation play less than the non uh, f uh, first the generations by the survey you know you know this data and you know where the problem exists. And then you have to get to the policy, or you have to get the improvement. How we improve the first generation college students to be more active in these extracurriculum activities and more involve them to be in these activities. So we find out that the first generation college students who had more advices from faculty members on career development participated more in both the extended learning activities and research related activities. We may see from the other way, if the faculty members talk more with these first generation college students on their career development in the future or even currently, that will influence the students to partici participants more those two types of activities. And another finding is the first generation college students perceiving more financial development and social support from the situation, from the institutions, participated more, those two types. So that means the institutions, you may provide the support, but you have to 
let the students realize that and let the student really use it. Uh, when we do the institutional survey, uh, the field of is visit, many universities show us, you know, we have all kinds of these student learning center, financial support center, uh, professional uh, development center. But if you ask the students, the student answer is that we don't know. We never use it. So university have this, but not really uh, uh, get into the students' their life doesn't make sense or doesn't make changes. So now we get to uh, the way that, that changing this make the faculty members more uh, have more communications talking uh, uh, the career development and personal development and social uh, engagement with these students and let the institutions make these uh, facilities more access. That will help the students. So after this survey or after this data, what I want to say is we have to construct an integrated model of improving st students' learning how to become an effective learner. It's not just the students, their business, not just the students' personal business. It's the whole university, the whole system has to work together. And also, a college students, they come to the college with a prayer experience uh, in study in the high school, uh, even their family background, that all influence there. So we have to think about students uh, as a whole person, not just classroom students uh, in my class, 50 minutes, and I take care of them, and then bye-bye, I left them. No. And learning is a student's most important issue. They have to engage themselves. But it's also a t teacher's responsibilities to help the students, to know, to push sometimes even the students, uh, to attract, uh, attractive, make the learning more attractive, more personal relative with the students. You have to realize the needs and the obstacles and the ways that students uh, personally used, and understanding th this will help you to make your design of teaching more uh, reasonable, accepted by the students. So in this uh, framework, you can see the education, school education or university education include, of course, faculty, classroom teaching, but also include extracurriculum activities, peer activities. So the integrative learning is the most important things which I want to con convince uh, both students and the educators. And students in the classroom or in the universities, not just learned in the classroom, they learned through the whole environment. Extracurriculum are very, uh, ac activities are very important. And learning is not just a knowledge learning, it's a socialization, it's a culturally uh, growth. Uh, so in this way, you understand when they graduate from the university, get into their career, get into the society. They become a professional, no matter uh, what positions, what roles uh, particularly they get. They become a citizen. Uh, they become a family person to play the role as a father, mother, as, you know, so what? Education should concerns to make the students more effective is to treat them 
as a whole person, make the education as a whole uh, uh, things that including a lot of elements. So if we make this uh, education as a whole person's development, as a whole environmental uh, 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 improvement, I think that will help the students to be more effective. So let's back to the main questions. How to become an effective learner in a changing society? You have to think of yourself. You have to think about the system, the institutions, teachers, even your background, uh, even you know the, the way that you have grew up. So learn and practice with great devotions and aspirations live and work in an active and constructive way. So that's the most important things. Pursue, choose, both independently and interactively. Now realize that learning is not the knowledge, but uh, social activities. Now make yourself more social. That will help you to be more efficient. Back to the Question, the COVID-19 will go eventually, but the changes it brings will remain and may become even greater. So we, maybe we haven't realized these changes. They are gradually show. So let's be clear and well prepared for the changes in the future. And after COVID-19, what else? People have to realize that these uncertainties of the future, the uncertain, the challenge uh, will be with us. Uh, we have to be well prepared. OK, that's what I want to share with you. And questions will be welcomed. And I want to hear more from your perspective, how to be an effective learner. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's really solid fi findings from over 1 million students over 10 years, over 180 uh, universities and colleges. Um, so from the online students discussion, we selected um, two questions. Uh, more questions welcome if you can find, you can type them in. Uh, so first one, uh, despite that many countries have adopted remote learning or hybrid learning to minimize students' learning loss, entrenched inequalities in education systems such as rich and poor, urban, rural, and boy and girl, as well as students with special needs such as disabilities, could be potentially exasperated as a result of the pandemic. So how should we mitigate such phenomena? Please. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, human beings is the great, great diversities, although we concerns about equity and uh, equalities uh, in all the issues you mentioned, rich, poor, and uh, urban and rural boys and girls. But we think those questions, all those differences exist. Um, it will go with us. Pandemic or online learning may uh, s make some of the, these uh, gaps uh, even uh, wider. So that's why Tsinghua, when we start this uh, remote or this uh, online education, not just the start uh, for everybody the same, but we have a special funds to support the students which the you know, they need the technical support. They need the financial support to help them with, you know, the um, facilities. And even sometimes uh, they need the special assistance uh, in how to uh, use uh, those uh, online uh, equipment, both students and teachers. So university realize that those kind of 
needs we need to solve and then to make the online learning more efficient. So I think policy, from the policy perspective, all these differences, if you realize that, some of the ways that may uh, uh, helping to solve or make the gap uh, 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 less, and we should try. So the, that's the positive way. And another way to see this issue is that when an unprepared things happen, the, you, you have to realize that uh, some of the problems has been hidden there. And when unprepared things happen, and these hidden things come out, and that for us, you have to really face it. And this time, the, the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, this uh, disease, and also the new way of teaching and learning really show us some hidden problems and help us to realize that the how complicated situations we are dealing with. So I'm still very positive that as an educator, I don't believe we can solve all the problems we are facing. But we have to realize that you may not change the whole thing, but you may change one and two students. And those two, those, for those one or two students, what you have done is really change their world. So, so if you believe that, have the conscious that helping those disadvantaged students realize that some of the, you know, the gap, not because of the student themselves, but because some other reasons and help to solve those reasons uh, with them. And that make a difference too. Yes. So shall we have the next question? Uh, how to release problems such as a lack, the lack of in-person interactions of hybrid education mode? <laughs> That's another very good question. Uh, you know, in-person in, uh, interactions, personal interactions, uh, different people really interact differently. Uh, some people are more uh, outspoken and more sociable. And some students very reserved and quite silent. And, and even uh, for our studies um, in education and psychologies and cultural uh, studies, uh, there are some saying that Chinese students are uh, more silent, uh, silence Chinese uh, students in the classroom. So this online learning make them even mo more uh, silent because they're uh, study alone. So if you realize that it's not really a cultural difference as some uh, study has shown. Based on our study, for example, the Chinese learner, although they are not as active sometimes in the classroom as their peers. Uh, we have this um, Swartzman College, uh, which enroll a lot of, you know, uh, foreign students uh, from Western countries and top, very selective top students from top universities. They are very active. Uh, sometimes uh, the teachers have to really um, limit it, uh, their talking in the classroom. Otherwise, you know, t students talk more than the teachers. So that's the difference. But encourage the in-person interactions that's uh, from the skill uh, level you know the teacher you have to realize that to learn in some skills may help you but also it's a it's a cultural issues you have to realize that maybe some students they're quite silent but they're using their minds so maybe you see they are not with you uh, 
in words, but they are using their minds. And then, so you have some other ways to communicate with students. And the RAIN classroom in uh, Tsinghua uh, use the technology. For example, some students, they don't want to talk. OK, and you have these words to show. So without talking, you communicate with teachers. I think online education or technology assistant education really help us to have more ways of in-person interactions. And both teachers and students need to learn those uh, variety of ways of communication. Um, that's the end of the question. Uh, we are really grateful for this wonderful and inspiring talk. And we understand actually behind these findings are really uh, unwavering determination and devotion yes. to understand effective learners and also support them along the way, especially those learners uh, who are disadvantaged in, in social and economic status. So thank you very much again for Professor Shi Xinhuan of Institute of Education. And also thank you so much for uh, the audiences and also for your wonderful questions. So let's call it today. Um, that's the end of this master class. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.